This video is sponsored by World of Tanks. Every single day, over 5 million New Yorkers use the subway system, and it has a reported annual ridership of over 1.7 billion. So it's no exaggeration to say that ever since its opening on October the 27th, 1914, it has become one of the biggest transit systems in the entirety of the United States. The track lines are extensive. In fact, should you lay the tunnels in a straight line, they could reach from New York City to Chicago underground. This profound project has been centuries in the making, and it doesn't just start with the subways. Today, we discover the story of New York's iconic subway system. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Let's take a trip back to the 19th century to learn how New York came to thrive as America's largest city. For starters, it saw incredible growth in trade and commerce thanks to the New York Harbor and the newly built City Hall, opening to great success after the city government moved out of the old federal building. Many famous names were on the rise, including Washington Irving, P.T. Burnham, and John Jacob Astor. In these times, New York's ports were critical to the cotton industry of America. Southern planters would ship goods via the East River docks to mills in various English industrial cities such as Manchester for textile manufacturers to process. Once the textile products were finished, they would be sent back to New York markets. Not unsimilar to the arrangement we have with China on the west coast of the United States today. However, it wasn't until the 1825 opening of the Erie Canal that the United States would be unified in trade. The canal marked a new era for the growing metropolis, and it wasn't long before goods flowed in and out of New York City with even more efficiency. New York was indeed the heart of trade in the United States. This status came with other infrastructure improvements such as the 1837 Croton Aqueduct providing clean water for its citizens and the first municipal agency, the New York City Police Department. Thanks to the influx of German and Irish immigrants in the 1840s, joined by Southern and Eastern Europeans in later years, the city also saw a significant boom in its population. These immigrants settled neighborhoods, joined the trade and political organizations, and built churches and social clubs. New York City also contributed significantly to the manufacturing business at the time. So at this point, you might be wondering, with such a massive population, how did everyone get around back then? In 1827, the first form of public transportation in New York City was the horse-drawn omnibus. These vehicles were essentially large stagecoaches that could hold up to a dozen people at a time. Though horse-drawn carriages were not a new idea in the city by any means, the omnibus was different in that it ran along a designated route and was by far more affordable to the general population. In fact, the omni in the word omnibus means that the bus would serve everyone. Made of wood, metal, and steel springs, it's not hard to imagine how uncomfortable long rides must have been in particular due to the cobblestone streets. Fares were paid upon boarding, and when a passenger wanted to get off, they would pull on a leather strap that would notify the driver by yanking his foot. Five years later, in 1832, mass transit would see another set of improvements with the introduction of the first horse-drawn streetcar line from Bowery and 4th Avenue to Prince and 14th Street. Well, similar to an omnibus, instead of running across the cobblestone streets, its wheels ran across steel tracks that were laid into the road. This allowed for a much smoother ride and made travel not only more efficient, but more affordable. The fare was reduced and the capacity was also increased to carry far more passengers. In fact, this original streetcar route was a direct relative to the modern day Metro North Railway system, which still sees millions of passengers every year. This shift in transportation had a remarkable effect on the lives of New Yorkers across the city in terms of life and work. Streetcars could carry around 20 people, 
pulled by two horses at a front, running in four-hour shifts per pair of horses. A total of eight horses were kept for each vehicle. By 1867, as New York City continued to grow as a metropolis, elevated rapid service steam trains began to crop up. They connected various parts of the city to each other, running well above street level. They were crucial to mass transit as they were able to carry far more passengers, improving on areas in which the omnibus and streetcars lacked. In no time at all, the elevated trains became another incredibly important part of New York's still expanding public transportation system. In fact, in 1878, the New York elevated railroads carried 14 million passengers and nearly doubled that in less than a year. These were very welcome changes because using horse-drawn streetcar coaches to get around had large drawbacks health and sanitation concerns due to the manure the horses pulling the carriages left behind on the busy city streets. By the 1870s, New Yorkers took over 1 million horse car trips per year. Some serviced citizens of New York City traveling across the city daily, while others primarily hauled freight from incoming trains to their destination. But the city needed to eliminate this practice altogether. Let me explain why. The horse transportation issue was futureless, as the hygiene situation was out of hand. Each horse left 22 pounds of manure on the street every single day, which came to an aggregate of around 1 million pounds per day. Thousands of citizens basically walked the streets, which were an equivalent to an open and rancid sewer. And while crossing sweepers offered services to pedestrians by clearing paths through feces, it wasn't nearly enough to keep the streets clean. Soon enough, disease started to spread, taking the problem from disgusting and inconvenient to an outright public health crisis. Another concern about using horse-drawn vehicles was the immense task of keeping all the animals healthy and in working condition. Vast acres of land had to be dedicated to supplying the horses with the tons of oats and hay that they needed each year. But transitioning to a new form of transportation was not going to be an easy task by any stretch of the word. While the banning of horse-drawn carriages had been done before in other cities, for New York, this seemed impossible. Without an efficient way to circulate goods to and from train stations and ports, New York City's long-built reputation as one of the nation's most important trade centers would be in serious jeopardy. So another question arose, what could replace the horse-drawn vehicles in the first place? 1883 saw the innovative introduction of steam-powered cable cars. They rode along the same tracks and routes as the million pound manure producers once did. And not only did they completely eliminate the pollution concerns, they were also much faster than the horses were. These cable cars didn't cost nearly as much in maintenance per year as the horses did, and they were able to carry far more passengers. Truly, these cable cars were a hallmark of New York City's incredible growth. As the lines gained traction and speed, so too did the city itself, speeding up around them. Additionally, the New York suburbs started to develop alongside a rise in new technology. However, this evolution in public transit also brought with it unforeseen dangers. The cable cars that ran across Brooklyn were so fast that they quickly became notorious for endangering pedestrians. One little known fact about the Los Angeles Dodgers is that they got their name during their start in New York. Originally called the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers in 1895, the name was later shortened to the Dodgers. The year 1903 brought the transition from steam power to electricity with the 9th Avenue line of the elevated rapid service leading the change into this new trend of power. Others were quick to follow in the tracks of the elevated lines and slowly but surely the old wooden cars were placed in museums to be admired as relics of the past. At the same time carriages made of sturdier materials replaced them. This made passengers not only more comfortable, but safer overall. And yet, this wasn't enough to support the masses of New Yorkers that rode the service lines every single day. The elevated railroads were incredibly beneficial to the city, though they were often a nuisance to passer buyers. They put out a lot of smoke and noise and blocked the sunlight on the streets below them. 
And so New Yorkers began to consider the possibilities of tunnels beneath their feet. Subways became viable thanks to the introduction of practical electric power, and it is important to note that New York City's subway system was many years in the making. In fact, the unofficial first subway was designed by the editor of Scientific America, Alfred Eli Beach, and driven by pneumatic power. This bizarre system was opened in 1870. The Beach Pneumatic Transit was a short 312-foot underground tunnel that ran from Warren to Murphy Street, close to City Hall. The engineering used to make it possible was remarkable at the time. An 8-foot-long car carrying up to 18 passengers was blown through the tunnel with a 100-horsepower fan. When it needed to return, the blower would simply reverse and suck the car back in the opposite direction thanks to its powerful vacuum. Beach soon received a charter to extend the line, but the focus on electric traction motors rendered his incredible project as little more than a public demonstration or a novelty. Today, the entirety of the line has been replaced by the City Hall station under Broadway. In 1897, Boston opened the United States' very first official subway, though it is important to note that the Tremont Street subway was not a rapid transit system, but rather a streetline car. Thanks to the long-standing rivalry between the two cities, New York was quick to fire back with a plan to construct its very own underground rapid transit system, and you will not believe how ambitious it was. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by World of Tanks, a free-to-play game with over 100 million players worldwide and for PC. The game has more than 600 tanks, destroyers, artillery, light, medium, and heavy tanks. So there's always a new way to play. You can roll out across open fields, climb steep hills, sneak through the forest, tear across deserts, and pick your battles in urban or industrial zones. Rally your teammates, devise a battle plan, and destroy the competitor in over 40 battle areas. Historical accuracy and inspiration means that authentic models and vehicle characteristics make you feel like a real tank commander taking part in a furious armed offensive. You can earn experience, modify and upgrade your tank, create a steel beast ready for any challenge. So check out December's holiday ops that feature daily missions. Holiday Spirit and Commander Arnold Schwarzenegger by clicking the link in the description to download the game right now. During the registration, use code TANKMANIA to get your free 7-day premium account, 250,000 credits, the premium tank Excelsior Tier 5, and 3 rental tanks for 10 battles each, Tiger 131 Tier 6. Cromwell B Tier 6, and T34-85M Tier 6. And now, back to New York Subway. Starting at City Hall in Manhattan, the new subway line opened on October the 27th, 1904. It ran along the routes of modern-day number 6 and number 1 trains in the Grand Central Shuttle. It boasted four lines with express stations at the Brooklyn Bridge, 14th Street, Grand Central, 72nd Street, and 96th Street. Local stations were around a quarter of a mile apart. In November of that same year, a branch that ran the same route as today's number two and number three trains was opened. As the station platform extended over time with shifts towards longer subway trains, the original station at City Hall, Worth Street, and 18th Street were eventually closed and abandoned but we'll talk more about that later in the video. The subway line saw many more extensions in this time. In 1906, it was extended north along Broadway to the Harlem Ship Canal. In 1905, it was extended south from Broadway to the South Ferry. 1907 saw an extension to 225th Street, and in 1908, it would reach 242nd Street and Atlantic Avenue, the latter being the route that the number four train runs today. In full, the subway line totaled an incredible 23.5 miles. However, the subway line was not without opposition. In fact, it caused a stir amongst Broadway property owners during the construction of the route, who opposed the line being constructed on Lower Broadway. The plans underwent countless legal and financial obstacles on their way to fruition. 
though it finally began with a groundbreaking ceremony presided over by Mayor Van Wyck in front of City Hall on March the 24th, 1900. It took four years to complete, and its construction was an incredible feat, carried out by the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, which was New York City's first subway company. Much of the construction can be attributed to an Irish immigrant named John McDonald. McDonald was born in Cork in 1844, though at the age of just four years old, he immigrated to the United States, fleeing the 1845 Irish famine. His first experience in New York's booming construction business was the Boyd Corners Reservoir. Even though he had very little to no experience in the field, McDonald was an incredibly quick learner. He amazed those on the site with him with his aptitude for work, and it wasn't long until his great efforts bore fruit. In 1874, he was named the Inspector of Masonry for the New York Central's 4th Avenue Tunnel. McDonald soon became a superstar in New York's construction industry. He was in high demand and put on countless additional projects towards the end of the 1800s. McDonald later became an independent contractor and he was hired in 1889 to build the Howard Street Tunnel for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. His project was so successful that he found himself in the good graces of Tammany Hall, which essentially ran New York City at the time. Thanks to this strong prominence, McDonald was able to win a bid for the city's very first subway line. The 1894 Rapid Transit Act ordered builders statewide to construct rapid transportation systems for cities with over 1 million inhabitants, laying the framework for New York City's incredible subway system. However, McDonald almost lost that bid. Originally, he bid $35 million, which was worth about $1 billion in today's economy. His rival, Andrew Onderdonk, bid $39 million and was close to winning, but at the last moment, he wasn't able to post the required $5 million in security bonds. Hence, the project defaulted to the second place bidder, and McDonald was promptly contracted by the Interborough Rapid Transit Company and given four years to build what could easily be one of the most difficult projects in all of New York City history. To construct the massive system, McDonald used the cut and cover technique, a highly destructive but ultimately effective way of building. At night, dynamite would be used to blast the streets, and during the day, large crews would clear away the rubble. After the rubble was cleared, workers would build the tunnel, and after the tunnel was built, it would be covered up with rubble and dirt, and then paved. This kind of work was incredibly dangerous. Over the course of four years, a total of 16 workers lost their lives during the construction. The subway system was opened on October of 1904, and on its very first day, around 150,000 people took a ride for a fare of five cents. Even though McDonald later referred to the job as quote-unquote nothing more than building a string of cellars end-to-end, there's no question that the subway system left a lasting impact on the city that can be seen every single day with its 36 lines and full length of 850 miles. One inevitability of a system this old and this vast is that with time, some of the lines and stations were abandoned. By far, one of the most notable if not tragic cases of abandoned subway stations is the decommissioned City Hall station. It was truly a marvel of architecture with vaulted ceilings, color glass tiles, large chandeliers, and skylights. Despite its beauty, however, it was one of the least used stops in the entire system. Out of all the other stations that had turnstiles installed by 1923, the City Hall station was not one of them. On top of this, it also had the nearby Brooklyn Bridge stop, which was far more popular as it was both closer to the connecting streetcars and visited more often by the express train. The curved platform the station had was also an issue. This curvature meant that no cars with center doors could be used at any point in the station unless they had specific door controls to open the doors. Furthermore, there was a lack of convenience for the commuters who passed these gates. 
Some who boarded at City Hall intended to go either to Brooklyn or below City Hall, and they'd find themselves on the uptown platform at the Brooklyn Bridge station. They then had to go upstairs and back down again to the downtown platform to continue on their way. And in a time where commuters wanted to get from point A to B as fast as possible, they often chose to just walk the far shorter distance at street level to the Brooklyn Bridge station. In 1945, the station was officially closed, abandoned, and forgotten ever since. Today it's impossible to access this stunning station, but you can admire it in passing if you stay on the train as it loops back around the tracks. In addition to this, the New York City Transit Museum occasionally hosts tours of the station for its members. The Worth Station, named after General William Jenkins Worth, was closed in 1962 as the Brooklyn Bridge Station gradually expanded. Due to its proximity, it didn't take long for this station to become obsolete. Sadly, much of its tiling and terracotta have been defaced by graffiti, and it sits as a shell of what it once was. Other stations faced a similar fate. The 91st Street subway station, which closed in 1959, was a six-track station belonging to the IND line that never opened and remained unused. It lies underground at South 4th Street, and with its fragmented structure, unbuilt stairwell, and lack of rail tracks and through tunnels, some might say it was more akin to a ghost station. It never saw any traffic at all. It was built with the intention of being a transfer and connection point for the IND second system, and those behind it were incredibly ambitious, or perhaps audacious, seeing as the shell was built before it was even determined whether or not the city could fund the project. In 2010, a project by the street artist Pack and Workhorse called the Underbelly Project led 100 street artists to the premise to paint the walls of the abandoned station with the goal of creating an underground art gallery. This project later ended up being replicated in Paris. In addition to these abandoned stations, and thanks to the tightening of New York City's budget, there are also many lost subway lines that were planned but never built. One of these lost lines is the Fulton Street Line, which was planned to run west under the East River from downtown Brooklyn to Manhattan, potentially connecting to the 2nd Avenue subway. Two side platforms were built at Brooklyn's Hoyt Schormerhorn stop to serve the line. They were ultimately closed, though still visible today. And believe it or not, there was even an underwater line planned to run from Brooklyn to Staten Island. The New York subway system remains a vital, not to mention famous, part of city life. After elevated rapid service trains and streetcars met their end, the system took over as New York City's primary mode of mass transportation. However, the maintenance and money to keep it up, with crumbling ceilings, delays, derailing, and even overcrowding is a major test to the city's government. These frustrations and concerns are something that the Metropolitan Transportation Authority alongside citizens fight for. Currently, there are plans in the works to modernize the subway system. In 2019, the MTA proposed to invest $51.5 billion into New York's transportation system primarily the subway. Out of the billions that were bound to be invested, Curbed reports that the subway system was to take $37.3 billion in order to modernize six subway lines, bringing in 1,900 new cars, making 70 stations ADA accessible, replacing tracks, and revamping 175 other stations. So as the city once rose itself from millions of pounds of horse manure, Perhaps it will one day freshen up the dingy subway. To which I'd pose this question, would that not destroy its charm? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, check out my New York City history playlist, and if you like a video about the history of the Holland Tunnel, click that subscribe button right now. This is Ryan Sokash, signing off.